the start of a foggy morning here in uh, Port Newark, Port Elizabeth, Port Elizabeth Channel. And uh, I think it's about time we talk about safety. So uh, I think I'm starting a whole new series. Don't worry, it won't be forever. I'll try to disperse it through other ones. I know everybody seems to like the boat handling videos, so I'll try to put these ones up every once in a while. But anyway, safety's a big thing. Safety of life at sea. Uh, you know, safety in general is a good thing, but especially on a boat. And what we do on our boats commercially, you can kind of uh, learn from and see what how it fits for your boats if you are in the recreational world. So anyway, this whole series, like I say, I want to start it off on safety and tell you how we do things. Not all of it will be, uh, I, I can't really show you our safety meetings per se, because those are kind of, uh, you know, they're proprietary to the crew, the boat, and the company, and not everyone, it's important to have people uh, participate in the, in the meetings and a camera sometimes makes people shut up and not do anything, but, except me. <laughs> anyway, so to start this off, we're going to talk about abandoning ship and uh, what that entails and the kinds of things we worry about. So stick around. I'm Tim, and this is Tim B at Sea. Agora nós temos legendas também em português. Voor Nederlandse ondertiteling, klik op de drie puntjes bovenin, dan op ondertiteling en vervolgens op Nederlands. U har nu ondertekst på svenska. Klicka på sluten bildtekst och väl svenska. Hola, ¿cómo están? Bienvenidos al canal de Team Baxea. Ahora con sus títulos en español. Vi har undertexter. So, for one reason or another, we have to abandon ship. And for the purpose of this video and the purpose of our training that we do, uh, we want to start thinking about not so much of being in New York Harbor where there's millions of boats and you wouldn't have to go too far, but more like we'd have a contract that we call going up and down the beach. And that doesn't really mean the beach, it just means that you're offshore towing on the wire. So that's kind of the scenario that we're going to set. For one reason or another, there could be a re bunch of reasons why we'd want to abandon ship. Um, obviously, uh, uh, we had uncontrollable leaking, dewatering wasn't going to work. Uh, maybe we had a fire, uh, maybe the boat gets tripped, we don't know what, what it is. But for one reason or another, we're going to say that we have to abandon ship. So there's some things that we have to do to do that. Obviously the first thing that uh, anybody does before we make the decision about abandoning the ship is we're going to sound the general alarm. That's going to get everybody up and everyone knows to report to the muster station with their life jackets in one hand and their gumby suits in another. What we call gumby suits, you might call exposure, sh exposure suits or uh, survival suits, all about the same thing. Uh, this is more dependent on the climate or the water temperature at the time that you use this. If you're in tropical waters, a gumby suit probably isn't that important. If you're in the northeast and it might be 10 below zero, and the water temperature might be right around 30 degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, negative two or three degrees Celsius. You're only going to have a few minutes that you can actively do anything in the water if you don't have some sort of protection. So uh, we can talk about that more as we go on, but there's 
stuff where people say, oh, well, you know, we can get cold. What happens is there have been people that have died that have swam over to a ladder, got to the ladder, and just couldn't move up. And this happens very quickly. Uh, hypothermia sets in, and although you are sending the signals from your brain to your muscles to move, they just can't, y y y nothing goes in gear. So anyway, sound the alarm. People show up to the muster station with their life jackets and their Gumby suits. And this is really critical. Nobody dons a life jacket or a Gumby suit in, while you're inside the boat. This is an extremely crit uh, important, critical thing. If anybody uh, does that, the reason why we don't do that is if the boat sinks quickly, you can't get out because of the buoyancy of either the Gumby suit or of the, of the life jacket will hold you up against the bulkhead that you're going to and you can't do it. So we don all that stuff outside. Now, obviously that doesn't have to do with uh, work vests. When we're working with work vests, the boat isn't in peril at that moment, so we should be fine. But uh, anyway, so if you are going, if you're in an emergency situation, you think the boat's going to go down, it might not be a good idea to be inside a confined space with your flotation equipment on. So we all don that outside. Uh, there's a couple things that I can tell you about. Uh, about a Gumby suit. I'm gonna do that right now. So, your PDF, your life jacket, shouldn't be one that you're gonna wear water skiing. It should be one that is rated for offshore and uh, has the ability to roll your head over. Everybody says, oh, I'm a great swimmer. I don't need a life jacket. The reason why we want really good life jackets or work vests or anything like that is that the event that we, somebody goes overboard odds are they're going to hit their head somewhere along the line and actually end up in the water unconscious. If you're unconscious and you lay with your head down like this, um, you're going to die. It doesn't matter if you sink or float, you're still going to die because no air will get into you and you're unconscious and you can't flip over. So it's important that you have one of these that will go and roll you over onto your back and so that's what we do. And we also have things like we have lights on here, and we have whistles on here, reflectors on here, boat names on here, and this is all important stuff for uh, our hopeful uh, rescue. So the next thing is the Gumby suit. Survival suit, exposure suit, whatever you want to call it. So my relief is a great big guy. I think he's like 6'4". He wouldn't fit in one of these. So we all have these green bags. This one's orange and this is like a universal one for, I think it goes up to like 6'2 or something like that. But these will do most people. And if you see a green one, it's for the more rotund mariner or in the case of my relief, he's like 6'4". He's a great big guy and he'd have a hard time getting in one of these. So he has a green bag. Um, most of our boats all have a number of large ones just so that if there's a, a big person on board, they won't have to fight with somebody to get the, the big one, you know, that we'll have enough of them on board. But anyway, um, it comes so you can hold it like this. It's got a strap on the back and buttons here. So if you do this right, hopefully I, I, I won't look stupid doing this, but you, the way you do it is if you come out, you don it outside and you go like that. Hey, it worked. <laughs> Anyway, so that's how you break it out. When you roll it out, as you can see, it's gonna be a big thing here. There'll be a light on here, whistle. Now we do some stuff, and this is just a little trick that we do. I shouldn't say we, mariners do this. You might find things like garbage bags in the pocket. And you might say, well, why do you have garbage bags in the pocket? The reason being is since we're, we're, we're donning these outside, there's a couple of these in here, um, you're probably going to have your work boots on. And if you spend the time unlacing, you've wasted time that you could be saving yourself. So you simply put these plastic bags on your feet and it makes it slippery so they slide right in. So you keep your shoes right on. So that's one of the safety features that we use. You'll also find things in here like a little thing of wax. Every time we use these, we wax the zipper. The, the zipper isn't watertight, but it's pretty close. And it makes an insulation barrier between the two. There's an air thing. You also have a pillow that will roll you up so that you do the right thing with mask around the face and that sort of stuff. So that's your Gumby suit. Once again, to recap, we only put on the Gumby suit and the uh, life jacket. We only don them when we're outside because we don't want to get stuck to the ceiling inside if the boat goes down. And they say that when tugboats sink, they usually sink like rocks. 
So let's hope we never have to test that theory out. But let's move on to the next thing. Okay, so now it's time to abandon ship. Everybody gets in their muster stations. And while this is happening, usually the master takes over command of what's going on, sending out the maydays, all that sort of stuff. The mate will usually go and instruct the deckhands to launch the life raft. In this case, you gotta forgive us, it's been foggy, but it hasn't been raining. And uh, we've got all kinds of nastiness on the deck that we just haven't washed off yet. But anyway, this is a 10 person life raft. And if you remember, we only have five people on our crew. But sometimes we have some tankermen on board, so that might be seven people. But you always, if you have a life raft that is only big enough for just how many people you have, the odds of you being the only one in, in peril are very minimal. Plus, you, if, you get, if you put four people in a four-man life raft, eh, you're really stretching it. And if you don't believe me, well, let's hope that we never have to test that. Anyway, we carry 10-man life rafts, even though we only have a five-man crew. And I don't think going big on a life raft is that bad. However, this is one thing that um, we, I've, we, I learned this at a company that I used to work for. It's very important that two people launch the life raft together, meaning in a time of emergency, you get a big, strong guy like Reggie, he could pick this thing up and throw it over the side. The problem is, it's not going to be flat, the boat's not going to be stable like this, it'll probably be listed over. Things are bad if you're going to, if you're, if you're going to abandon ship, things are messed up. The comp I used to work for a company that had the life raft here on the rail, and I think, I think the guy got sucked into a ship, he was doing some ship assist work, and the life raft rolled out and it fell down in between the... The, the rail in the house and when it did that it inflated and it was so tight in there they actually had to pop the life raft to get it out but uh, that's a that's a completely another story I just thought that was I always think about that so what we do is we have a policy that two men launch the life raft no matter what one on either side they throw it over and this is a good time to talk about how these life rafts work um, they're fixed with uh, something called uh, hydrostatic release and what this basically is, I'm gonna, actually maybe I can show you this. Let's see if I can do all this. I've got my new toys here, I'm trying to work all this out. Okay, let's try this. Okay, so this is the hydrostatic release. And what this is, this has a diaphragm in here, and this is a sealed chamber up here. Underneath the diaphragm is a rod that is holding back a spring-loaded guillotine or razor blade as the pressure around it from the atmosphere or in this case the water pressure starts to press around this because this area is sealed up here the diaphragm lifts up that pin goes releases the guillotine and it cuts this rope right here so that's how that works I think this one is set to uh, I didn't bring my glasses, but I'm pretty sure it's set to like three meters. So if it goes down to a depth of three meters, I could be wrong on that, but, I, but at any rate, hopefully, once again, we won't test this. If nobody launches the life raft, nobody launches the life raft, the boat goes down, this thing's going to cut this, and by cutting this, it lets this strap go. This strap is the only thing that holds it in place. The life raft will float up. But if you notice, when it does that, this is still clipped in. And this is on what they call a weak link right here. So that is will have an, hold enough pressure so that the line will continue to pay out and the life raft will start to float up. When it gets to the end, it will trigger the mechanism to inflate the life raft. The life raft inflates and that will give it enough buoyancy to break this weak link. And then people can go and uh, get in the life raft. And so it's really important if you have one of these, make sure you set it up the way they tell you to. You spend a lot for one of these, and it's there to save your life. And if you, don't, if, you, if you think you know better than they do, you probably don't. So do what they tell you to. Set it up exactly this way. And if, if we're going where people are going to launch life rafts themselves, you can see this is just a quick link here where you can squeeze this together, slide that up. Two guys lift this up and throw it out. You can even leave this connected right to the boat if you need to. Or you can unscrew it. It's on, both on a bowline over here and on a on a hand-tight shackle over here so that you can tie it off to the boat. Now, 
That comes to the next thing. When do you get in the life raft? On our boat, I have a standing order that nobody gets in the life raft. The mate and his deck crew can launch the life raft, but they don't get in it until the master or me tells them it's okay. And there's a reason for this. I won't let everyone get in the life raft till we all get in it together. And the reason why is I don't want four of us in the life raft wondering where the fifth guy is. And I don't want to have to pull somebody out of the life raft, put them back in peril to get back in there. We're a team, we're a family, we're a crew, and we get in the life raft together. So that's how I do it on our boat. Oh, hang on a second, I almost forgot something. <laughs> so, there have been many boats that have sunk and the rescuers found the boat floating before they ever found the crew in the life raft. So it's much easier for rescuers to spot a boat, you know, the sinking hull of a ship or maybe a, a sailboat laid over on its side, whatever it is, it's easier to find that than it is to find a floating life raft. So number one, don't get, don't abandon ship unless you absolutely have to and if you can, by all means, stay with the boat. Um, they have that weak link there, so if the boat does sink, it's not going to take you down with it. The, the weak link will break. So don't get in the life raft when you have to. And uh, most life rafts have about a 90-foot painter on it. So if you're sailing in 80 feet of water, even if the boat sinks, you've got a nice little anchor that's going to hold you there. And in the case of a tugboat, we have 1,200 feet of cable behind us and uh, the barge after that, the barge is going to be anchored. The, the tugboat is going to turn into a mooring for it. So the closer you can stay to the, to the scene of the accident, well, obviously if there's a fire that's a different thing, but that's something to keep in mind. All right, back to the video. And so there's a couple things. Now this is a good time to talk about this. As some of you may know, I've had a long time fantasy of sailing around the world one day. And to be quite serious, I'm getting a little closer to that. So hopefully, if everything goes well, God willing, maybe we'll be closer to that day one day. Anyway, in prepare, preparing for this, I've been dreaming about this for about 30 years. But in recent years, I've done, watched, there are probably about 30 sailing cha channels that I follow of people that have been sailing around the world. They've, many of them have taken a different course right now because, I mean, of course, with their video channels because of the pandemic. But anyway, many of them have had life raft specials. And they all seem to miss a couple really important things they 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 get their old life they get a new life raft and they launch an old life raft and they get in it and they they practice being in it and that's all great you guys should do all that that's wonderful but there's some things that they don't talk about that i think they really should so first first of all with our life rafts now with smaller yacht lo yacht life rafts i don't really know these these are the ones that we get trained in for our in our stcw classes we have to train in pools with them we have to do all kinds of stuff but they say roughly 10 per, uh 10 percent of the time or nine out of ten times you won't have any problem it'll inflate and everything will be right but there is about a 10 percent chance that it might inflate with the raft upside down now nobody mentions this and maybe it's not an issue in smaller ones but to flip a, a large 10-man or even 30-man life raft over, is it, it's surprisingly easy if you know the technique. So I just want to go over that with you. Who knows, you might be on a cruise ship or a ferry one day that goes down and you might have to roll one of these rafts over. So anyway, all you do is you, you go over and whether it's upside down or right side up, it's going to have all kinds of uh, soft ladders that you'll be able to climb up on top of it. Now right by right by usually about, about by the door you're going to find the cylinder it looks like a you know it's a like a fire extinguisher or maybe a a scuba tank and that's the co2 that inflates it so what you do is you get up on the on the raft and there's a line that goes right across from one side right to the other and you put your feet right on the tank you hold the line and you just fall back 
and you act as a pivot and it pops it right over and it, it, it's like it, it, if I hadn't done it in, in a tank in my STCW classes I would not believe it was that easy to do so it, it, it works and it does well there's a couple reasons why we want to do that that way first first of all because of the weight of the tank and your weight on the corner you can lean over and make a pivot but also you don't want that tank to come over and flip you in the head so if you're in a situation where people are panicking and a lot of people are getting on the raft all trying to help out, make sure that they're not going to get struck by this thing in the head. So if your feet are on it and you roll it over, you're going to roll it over, but the tank isn't going to hit you. So that's, that's something that's important. Now, one of, one of the things that I noticed that none of the channels, none of the sailing channels I follow have ever talked about, and that's that... When life rafts inflate, they should inflate with all... Now, remember, not everyone's this way. There's, that's why we have, uh, you know, why, why they have service states on them. They're supposed to be unpacked, inspected, and repacked or taken out of service. When they inflate, they should inflate with all the doors open. And I say doors, they're like tent doors, you know, zippy, zippy things. All of them should be open. Now, there's possibility that maybe they're not open. Nobody talks about this. These rafts are are inflated with carbon dioxide. In the event that you go and you it pops open, you're great, you jump in there, carbon dioxide's heavier than air. Hopefully, it's not blowing a gale when you're doing this. If it is blowing a gale, carbon dioxide probably is the least of your worries. But if it's not blowing a gale, and you go to get in, and you, when you get in, believe me, it's a lot harder than you think to get into a life raft. They have these ladders that are, we call them soft ladders. It's just a series of, uh, you know, uh, mesh ropes that hang down. You try to climb in there. It is very difficult for the first person to get in. But anyway, when you get in, you get in and you basically do a face plant right on the floor. And if that floor is covered with 18 inches of carbon dioxide, You've just ch traded one bad problem for another. So that's why all these, all these life rafts will inflate with the windows and the doors open because you're trying to vent that carbon dioxide out. I'm not telling you don't get in the raft. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying be aware of that. Nobody talks about that. So just be aware that the thing is, has to be open because there's carbon dioxide that did it. Another thing I, don't, I haven't seen in one sailing video that talk about this, they all talk about when the life raft goes, oh my God, it's leaking, it's leaking. Look, if you are making a life raft that can go and inflate when it's 20 below zero or 110 degrees out, you have to do it with enough inflatant, is inflatant, is that a word or am I making up words? Enough carbon dioxide to inflate it regardless of the air temperature outside. So what that means is they're overinflated. You don't want these life rafts to blow up and then pop like a balloon. So the manufacturers have the, the relief valve set so that they go and they blow it up and as they approach a certain pressure, relief, it'll start blowing up. Once again, if you get into a, ra a raft and you zip it all up, maybe you're getting in there in the night. The next morning when the sun starts hitting that raft, it's going to start expanding the gas in there and it might start leaking CO2 into the, uh, it, it, into the living space. And so uh, that's something for you to consider. So when you hear the life raft hissing, that's not a bad thing. That's because it's letting out carbon dioxide. It's supposed to do that. If they had it set, if they had it set so it was the right pressure at say 90 degrees, if it was, you know, 30 degrees out, the life raft would barely inflate because the, the difference in, well, you guys know all that. Anyway, okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is what do you grab? all these sailing channels they have grab bags they have water they have all this stuff you know what I say I tell my crew you're not grabbing anything if you grab anything it's only after you grab the one single most important thing to grab and that's this thing right here this is our EPIRB and uh, EPIRB is an acronym for electronic position locating indicator beacon I think I got that right anyway you see this little dot right here this thing right here you can pull this pin I'm not gonna do it because my mate does it once a hitch and he just did it the other day and I don't want to mess with it he tests it and all that so every time every time they come in the, the mate has to come in and do a whole inspection of the boat and write down the battery dates and the registration dates but anyway this is a plastic pin set up exactly the same way this is they're they're the same unit except one is designed to cut a 
cut rope the other's designed to cut this plastic pin so if you if we're coming over here they're going to pull this pin they're going to pull out the e -perb, and that's the only thing i care about bringing on the life raft people say well you need water you need all this hey you know what maybe you guys do if you're in the middle of the pacific in the doldrums life rafts come with water they come with food they come with fishing gear they come with uh, even rain catching stuff they have all that stuff i'm not suggesting that i'm saying if you bring an e -perb, your odds of being picked up before you ever have to get into any of that stuff are much, much better. So if you bring anything in the life raft, bring an EPIRB. The next thing I would say, if you're gonna bring something else in the life raft, if you're a coastal cruiser, maybe a cell phone. Maybe you might even have a cell phone in a Ziploc bag. I think more and more cell phones are becoming water resistant, but, uh, um, and of course a handheld radio certainly wouldn't hurt. But people that want to bring their laptops, or they want to bring this, or they want to bring that, that's not the design for this, you know, we're, we're not doing that. We're trying to save our life. We don't get in the life raft to have a fun story to tell at the bar. We don't get in the life raft to, uh, as like a, a, a new adventure thrill ride. We get in there because we're going to die if we don't. Speaking of which, on a towing boat, when we're towing up and down the, the beach, one of the things we cons are concerned about, if the, if the problem is not a fire, is our best life raft we have is going to be the barge ahead of us. So communication with the barge is very good. I'm not suggesting that we're going to swim 1,200 feet in the open ocean to get there, but what I am saying is that the barge can handle a lot of the... Uh, you know, contacting the authorities, they can, they can tell, uh, give our coordinates, and when we get in the life raft, um, it would be nice to think that we could paddle it over to the barge. In reality, I don't think that we are ever going to go down when the wind isn't honking and it's terrible weather and we're not going to and the life raft's just going to blow away. Speaking of which, I didn't talk about that. There's a, two schools of thought. Do you launch the life raft? upwind or downwind of the vessel. My instructions to my crew and especially my mate is that my mate has to make that decision depending on the situation. You can't be rigid to one thing. I don't know if this is a standard procedure or what they do. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of the yachties that love to correct me on all this stuff will tell me what they learned in their yacht class and all that sort of stuff. Hey, I live on a boat for more than 182 days a year out to sea and this is what we do all right so my my thing is if there's a fire we might want to launch away from the the we don't want to launch where we're going to be blow you know we want to be able to use the wind and the tire tide to get away from the hazardous smoke that's going that way if the sea is coming at us let's just say there's not a fire but the the, the wind is really bad and it's either on the port of the starboard side so if that happens, one school of thought says if you launch upwind, you're going to blow down onto the life raft. The other school of thought says if you launch downwind, you'll blow away from the scene of the accident, but probably no one will be able to get in the life raft because the life raft is such a big sail and it's just going to blow away. So what I direct my crew and my mate to do is that in the situation that we're at, you need to decide what is the best side to do and that's all I can say is that um, and in that time hopefully I'll be able to help make make that decision but uh, more than likely I'll be sending off SOS's and all that sort of thing so anyway that's that uh, what else have we discussed I think that's it anyway let me know in the comments what you guys do with your life draft left life raft stuff Incidentally, um, part of my safety thing, uh, maybe next the next safety video, I'll talk about the different drills that we do do. There are drills that we have to do within the first 24 hours that we're required to do. There are other drills that we have to do every time we do a crew change of more than uh, more than 25% of the crew has been changed. And there's also drills that we do weekly, bi-weekly, and monthly that the company has us do. And these are things that I can kind of lightly go over with you guys. It sounds silly, but when you think about how many recreational boaters have incidences, and you think of how, many, how much time they actually spend 
not on the boat at the marina drinking cocktails, but actually sailing versus how much time the professional mariners are spending at sea working. And if you look at the difference between how, uh, you know, the, the accident and survival rate of incidents has happened, that, that's, just, that's really a result of training. So I really, in, I implore all of you guys that if you have a boat, if you got a 22 foot Catalina, you got an 18 foot center console, or you got a 90 foot mega yacht, do whatever it is that you do, but you should have a couple plans, not up here, but on paper, and you should share them, and you should go, even if it's just a virtual thing around a table, this is our dewatering plan, this is how we're going to fight a fire, this is how we're going to abandon ship, this is how we're going to treat a man overboard, all these things, and you know, we even have things, we even have a drill that we do um, where we practice having a helicopter come and remove a guy from the deck, these are things you don't have to do, but the more you guys have a written plan, and, I, and like I say, I'm not one for taking notes or anything like that, but by writing the plan down, you can use the same exact words every time you have your safety meeting, and it registers in the brain more and more that way. A lot of my guys that have been with me for a while say that, man, the first 10 minutes of my safety meeting, they can almost recite it because I'm speaking almost the exact same thing that I have all the time. And the reason why I do that I think it's somewhere, some branch of the military says, we fight like we train. Well, hopefully on our tugboat, if we ever get into a situation, people won't think what to do. They'll just go right to the training and God willing, hopefully they'll hear some of the things that I've tried to put in their head. Or you as the master of your boat might want to put in, in, in people. And even if they're just going out for a day, they should know where a life jacket is. They should know that, that if there's a fire, this is what we need to do to contain it. Or how, how we're going to go. You don't need somebody jumping off the boat just because uh, uh, the, you know, the high level bilge alarm went off because your bilge pump didn't work. That's not a reason to abandon ship. So anyway, that's that. Um, so I hope you found this video interesting. Uh, if you did, give it a thumbs up. It always helps. Big shout out to the patrons out there on Patreon. And uh, thank you so much for subscribing. And thank you for leaving your comments. And you guys be safe out there. And I'll see you on the one.